Hi, I'm Wendy Bounds, and welcome to Off Duty. We have a great show for you, and I promise no more Oscar stuff. You're going to have to wait till next year for that. But if you're still looking for drama, we have plenty of that, including a story of crime, sex, greed, and corruption. And did I mention the puppets? You have to see this one to believe it. What did Mr. DeMora do after he met the two women? He left the gambling table. These aren't the Muppets, and what these puppets are saying is not meant for kids. Today in Puppets Court... A wiretapped conversation played in court where county employee Kevin Kelly jokes with Jimmy DeMora about the possibility he picked up herpes from a hooker in Vegas. The puppets court is what happens when you tell a local TV station their cameras can't be on hand for the corruption trial of a notorious former county commissioner who's accused of padding his backyard with ill-gotten luxury items. Hey, Jimmy. How you doing, buddy? How you doing? Everything's good. Always waiting for the other shoe to fall. There is no other shoe to drop. The man in question is former Cuyahoga County Commissioner Jimmy DeMora, and his trial reads like a Sopranos episode. Since they began investigating him in 2008, federal agents say they witnessed Mr. DeMora accepting cash, gambling trips, and prostitutes from businessmen who were seeking contracts with the county. But because the case is being tried in federal court and cameras aren't allowed inside, local television stations didn't have any good footage of the trial. The news director at 19 Action News thought the answer was puppets. That she talks a lot, and he told me that he told her he was county commissioner. He mentioned that they had sex or something along those lines. How did you react? Then he told Suzanne he was county commissioner. I told him, are you nuts? Why would you tell her that? Prostitutes, uh, parties in uh, Detroit, parties in Canada, parties in Las Vegas. So, uh, you know, the thought of having to do that with just sketch artists um, didn't, didn't appeal to us. So we, we talked about different ideas on how we might be able to visualize it. And, and it, uh, one of my ideas was to uh, maybe we should use puppets. Well, I think my favorite moment uh, probably, and I think it's a lot of people's favorite moment, was early on when one of the prostitute puppets had money being stuffed down her uh, blouse. Um, that was certainly, and there was, so there was nothing spoken there, but it was, uh, but you didn't need to speak. Let's get together and have some lunch or dinner or something. Okay, buddy. Don't worry too much. I, yeah, I listen to his voice and his mannerisms and his personalities, and it, sometimes it takes a while to, to get exactly into his, uh, into his voice. I mean, this is his favorite position, actually, lately. You know, but it's like, uh, you know, Ferris, you mother... Oh, sorry, I can't say that. Yeah. He, for me, he almost sounds like um, um, a higher Barney Fife. Mel Blanc did Barney Fife. You know, like, are you Wilma? Are you Fred? And I just take it, you know, I'm no angel, but I'm no crook. I didn't do anything that no other politician had done did do, or something like that, yeah. Every day a reporter heads to court and transcribes the day's testimony. Right. Talking, 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 and in three, two, one. Then they take it back to the station where a producer writes out a script and produces a quick sketch with a troop of puppeteers. In the Grand Canyon scheme of charges against Jimmy, it does appear his team showed the jury this job. Oh, me. You know that? Wow. Kiss your mother with that mouth? You see, Kevin Kelly is calling in a... The anchor in the skits is Nutty the Squirrel, the alter ego of Kirk Maynard, the ventriloquist and puppeteer who owns the puppet company. To start, Jimmy, we'll see what pebbles they throw up tomorrow on the Puppets Court. In this edition of Puppets Court, we're talking Rolex watches, plasma TVs, and a refrigerator given to Jimmy... The ratings are up 56% among 25 to 54-year-olds since the puppet court started to air last month. And news is not only what's important, but it's also what's interesting. If anyone wanted to avail themselves of their services... Closing arguments are scheduled for this week. And the cash flowed as easy as the easy women. And who says local news is boring? That story displays a certain kind of do-it-yourself ingenuity. We're going to keep that going in our next segment here, which features the growing trend of interior design and construction using recycled materials. Sounds very green. I got salvaged lumber going to dumpster, and I built a cocktail bar, an old school cocktail bar. The back bar is built out of 100-year-old pine floors that came out of my neighbor's house when they were tearing it out. 
distressed and in the garbage old oak sideboard unit turned into stunning shelving. Using reused materials is becoming a much more normal. It's becoming a standard way of doing things now, you know, reclaimed flooring for one example. What we've done is not covered it where you would on a regular floor because I want every scratch and burr because I want it to look weathered and in. It's an important next step in increasing recycling across the U.S. is addressing the amount of waste generated by construction and demolition. A lot of times, if you're in the right place at the right time, people will give you the materials rather than pay, you know, $700, $800 a dumpster to throw it away. So this was something that was slated for demolition. Right here, we're looking at a kitchen cabinet set that is obviously a great set. The owner of the apartment just had a, something slightly different in mind. I and mean, we went in, and in the course of a day, uh, we were able to take this apart as well as a bathroom. They can get a tax deduction, they can save materials from going in the landfill, um, and sort of you know, feel better about their construction project. Our hand done cherry and mahogany bar, we recycled the lumber from the old bar and brought it over in the same tree lumber and literally sanded it together and just make something you've never seen. Waste from construction and demolition projects accounts for about 40 to 50 percent of the waste in New York City. That's an incredible amount of uh, material. That's about 16,000 tons per day in the city, um, which are sent to landfills from uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio. Every year we remove about 900 tons of material from the waste stream um, and we bring it back to our, our reuse centers, which are stores. It's basically like the cross between a thrift store and a, a building, a box store, you know, so a Goodwill and a Home Depot. Any day we could get tiles, we could get doors, windows, furniture. It varies by day and so every day I wake up and wonder what I'm going to see. Our job, the way I see it, is to find good homes for the unwanted items of society. I have lighting fixtures that are with antique, 80-year-old glass. Repurpose, rethink, get outside the box and make a new box. And if you're looking to cook up something in that recycled kitchen, we have Kitty Greenwald, Slow Food Fast. If you're into pumpkins, you don't want to miss this one. Hi, my name is Kitty Greenwald, and this is Slow Food Fast. Today we're cooking a pumpkin soup made with butternut squash, potatoes, mascarpone, parmesan, and olive oil. From Ruth Rogers of the River Cafe in London. So the first thing that you're gonna wanna do is stew the tomatoes. So you smash open three cloves of garlic, turn on the heat to low, Pour in two tablespoons olive oil, your three cloves smashed garlic, and this is one teaspoon fennel seed, and voila. It should start to smell a little bit. So these are seven San Marzano tomatoes. You drain the seven tomatoes from the juice. You don't want the juices around it, but you do want to capture the juices inside it. I would just tear it open. And you can continue to break up the tomatoes as they cook. The darker you go, the sort of the richer the orange hue of the soup will be. It'll all sort of meld together. And this is when you want to start prepping your vegetables and just sort of do it right near the stove. This is a 2.3 pound butternut squash. Butternut squash is a good substitute for pumpkin because the flesh is sort of dense and it's nice and sweet. Slice away the skin. If you work with the tip of your knife when going around, it's a little easier. But you just take a spoon and you scoop out the seeds. And I don't really mind sort of the stringy bits. Maybe I'm supposed to. Now you cube it and you cube it into three quarter inch pieces. Cubing away. Now we peel the potatoes. These are waxy potatoes. You can use any kind of potato you like, really. Okay, so now all the liquid has evaporated. So you can already see that getting tighter and tighter. You add your vegetables. So this is about two cups. Chicken stock. Bring this up to a boil, then reduce it to a simmer. You're not gonna cover it. Uh, you want the water to sort of evaporate. So now you can turn off the heat, mash it with your masher. So you're breaking up the potato and the squash. It's okay that it's sort of coarse, thick, sludgy. You're done. So now I'm gonna show you how to plate it.
This should really be sort of thick enough to be eaten with a fork if you like, but that's the consistency you want. We're gonna finish it with some dollops of mascarpone, some olive oil, and a final grating of Parmesan. You can taste the fennel, the potato, and the pumpkin, and the tomato have all sort of come together. It's really nice. Now, most of us have seen Extreme Makeover Home Edition, but not all of us can get host Michael Maloney to come redo our living room. Still, he gives Kelsey Hubbard some tips on how the right kind of inspiration can bring any room to life. Forget bland and boring. When it comes to interior design, you want to be inspired. Hello, I'm Kelsey Hubbard, and I'm here with Michael Maloney from Extreme Makeover Home Edition. And we're going to show you how to take an Asian inspiration. It is the Year of the Dragon, yes, after all, yes. and bring it into your home. Let's go. Hey, Michael, what'd you find? Well, I'm loving all of the sculptures right here. You've got Buddha heads, you've got full-on Buddhas, and look how they glaze them in different colors, too. Yeah. So if you have a theme and a color going through the house, you know, you could put one of these, one of these in a bookcase, really beautiful, one of the heads like that on top of a bookcase. Again, really has impact, it has drama, but you're not going overboard. Already I'm seeing a little whimsy. Here. Right, how fun for a kid's know, room, right? Yeah. To hang these over a little girl's bed would be so cute. There's all different choices in here, and they're so reasonable. A whole box of these is only $12. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you about, because yeah. a lot of people, when they think of an interior design project, they see dollar signs just yeah. calculating yeah. in their head, and so they back away, but you really can do it on a budget if you're And smart. you don't have to do it all at once. Right. You know, but I mean, what little girl wouldn't want this hanging over her bed? This is pretty awesome, isn't it? Look how beautiful this is. Yeah, they're very detailed. These right? Girls. And I also like that it's natural, so it's not going to fight with anything else in the room. You know, there's so much influence right now with like even this kind of thing, raw wood and all of that um, sort of influence. So this is a really elegant way to bring that. And that could divide a room, right. you know, very elegant in a living room. It could also just go in the corner with a beautiful like, palm in front of it. I love these. They're sort of a pagoda shape. They're nylon lanterns. And again, you can, you know, keyless is, is one of those ceramic things you just screw a bulb in. Okay. Right? This can just go right on top of that. Or they look great in the backyard, front yard, hanging in a tree. Right. Really, I think they're really elegant and really pretty. And they definitely speak of, of Asian culture. When you decide to go for a theme, is there a fine line between kind of being subtle and then going over The line is not fine. <laughs> it's a big nice. black line in the sand. <laughs> So, if, so people are watching and they want to get a little bit inspired. I mean, this yeah. is the year of the dragon. Maybe yes. they're going to go Asian. Exactly. Uh, how do they do it without well, you know, like, like, crossing that line? You know, on the show, the kids' rooms that we did were really over the top. Right. Theme, theme, theme. I think in a kids' room, that works. In common spaces, living room, dining room, kitchens, you know, what we're talking about today is influence. Right. So little influence. Just do touches. And, you know, you could paint a room with Chinese red and not have anything else Chinese in it. I mean, this is fun and we just had fun with it, but it's actually a very sculptural piece. I don't love the finish on this, but if you did that in black lacquer and put that on a, on a sofa back table, really yeah, elegant, really right? In a family room or living room. The light hits it, it is, the it's, it's, it's very nice. sculptural and it's fun. Yeah. All right, next. Do your homework. Number one, go shopping, see what's out there. Use the internet, such a great tool to see what's available. Um, shop or you can return stuff. Yeah. So you could take it That's home and try it and yeah. see if you like it. You know, a lot of your um, interior design stores or home furnishing stores will let you take it on what they call memo. You leave a check and you take it home for a day and you try it out. Show the husband, Yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> but if you're not sure, it's just a great way to get it in the house. And then, I mean, third of all, I would just say go for it. Yeah. You know, you gotta have some guts and get in there and, and take a risk, have a little fun with it. Right. And if you're not confident, if you have a friend like who you love their house, you love their style, Take them shopping with you and, and make it a fun thing for you and a friend to do together. And finally, surf's up in Munich. Dude, it's only one of the most unique things you can only do in Munich, Germany. And our own Jeff Bush, he hangs 10 and he hangs with monks off duty. Munich is a city with many things to offer. Beautiful architecture, good food, the famous Glockenspiel. If you're into that sort of thing. My guide, archaeologist Taft Simon, has promised to show me a different side of Munich. But first, I wanted beer. Not just any beer. Beer brewed by monks. I headed into the Bavarian woods just outside of Munich to the Andiks Monastery. The brothers at the monastery operate a brewery and a restaurant high at the top of a hill. Beer has been brewed here for over 500 years, so they must have it down by now. 
I couldn't wait to see the monks tending vats of beer, patiently practicing their ancient craft. Due to some kind of gross miscommunication across the Atlantic, I'm not actually going to get to film any monks. It turns out monks really do adhere to rules of silence during certain times of the day, and this was one of those times. During this time, visitors to the brewery are strictly forbidden. Finally, I was able to speak to one monk, in fact, the head monk. He explained the monastic tradition of brewing beer. Benedictine monasteries have always been centers in which different arts were cultivated, including winemaking and beer brewing. When I first heard about this place, I pictured a small, more artisanal approach. Perhaps in a cave someplace. Not so. This is a completely modern brewery that distributes more than 180,000 gallons of beer a year. The monks also run a beer hall at the monastery where they serve, in addition to their own beer, of course, locally made delicacies. I'm an unabashed, unashamed, and unapologetic sausage lover, so for all you vegetarians out there, you might want to look away. The thing about the sausage here, I'm in proud. It's also fresh. It's made right here. It's cheap. It's cost me about three euros, around five dollars. Uh, you know, while there's still the euro is still around. And this is good because you need something with all this beer. This is a small. Now back to Munich. My guide has promised to show me a hidden side of Munich. St. Peter's Church is in the heart of the city and has a very special something tucked away in a quiet corner. The body of a saint that has been dead for 1,700 years. Now, Mandita is quite an obscure saint, and not a great deal is known about her. Uh, the many legends about St. Mandita. One version is that she is a uh, Christian in, in Rome, about the year 360. Her father was a pagan. He hated the Christians and was always short of money. He said to his daughters, to pay the rent, you're going to work as prostitutes. And Medea said, I refuse to work as a prostitute. Her father was very angry, he was very worried that the other daughters would follow suit. So to make an example of Mandita, he cuts her head off with a hatchet. Now because she died for her faith, she was revered as a martyr and was buried in the catacombs in Rome. No one ever explained how she got her head back, but anyway, back to the story. There's a big trade in what we call holy relics, the bones of the saints. Right. But often the people dealing these relics are, are criminals. Yeah, a little shady. Than, than yeah. gangs, yeah. very shady. Yeah. So they stole her, they dug her out and they stole her. This happened to be a, a merchant who was from Munich and Rome on business. They said to him, Psst, don't buy some relics. <laughs> he said, fantastic. Did they have a you coat guys. and then you want to buy very some relics? So. <laughs> this is how it worked. <laughs> he said, fantastic, I'll buy her. So we bought her and brought her back to Munich in the 1570s. And she's lived here ever since. Taff is going to show me something you don't normally associate with Germany. Surfing? I know this is not history exactly, but this is crazy. What is, what is going on here? Uh, when people hear that you can go surfing in Munich, they think, crazy, how is that possible? But uh, as you can see behind me, we have this wave this artificial wave, and it's very popular in Munich. Yeah, popular even on days like today when it's 10 degrees. I have no idea what the water temperature like, and I'm not planning on finding out. It might look easy, but Taff warns me it's not for beginners. Even these experienced canal surfers wipe out from time to time. You want to try it? Not today, after you. Oh, I'm shoot, I left my wetsuit at home. Huh? And that's it for Off Duty Today. Please leave your comments below and click the like button if you see something you like. I'm Wendy Bounds. Hope you'll join me on Facebook and Twitter, and I will see you back here tomorrow.